hello, hello. So glad to have in-person conferences again. <laughs> it's just like way better than giving a talk out of my bedroom. <laughs> so, well, um, I am going to talk today uh, to try to give you, by the end of this talk, I, I, I'm going to try to give you a mental framework to make technology decisions that you're going to make, whether you're working on your project, team, company. And the way I'm going to try to do that is I'm going to try to reflect on some of my experiences in uh, running PyTorch and using this uh, mental framework that, that, that I've, I've been using to drive a lot of decisions um, for PyTorch. So uh, let's get started. First, uh, we, like, we, we, we need to establish who the technology we're building is going to be serving, it's like who's actually using your technology. So like I'm going to talk uh, mostly in the context of PyTorch, so I'm going to talk about uh, the machine learning uh, programmers. So let's talk about a few kinds of um, experts that are in the machine learning field itself. Uh, first, uh, you can think of algorithmic experts. They're basically uh, trying neural networks, gradient boosted trees. They're like cleverly uh, building new kinds of neural networks that have never been built before. They're driving a lot of value and innovation by like writing clever loss functions or like clever uses of training loops, like building things like GANs or something. And, and like they have a whole suite of tools and knobs available to them to drive uh, innovation. Uh, and then you have people who are basically really good at building data and feature engineering, uh, cleaning data, collecting the right amounts of data, um, and the, uh, collecting the right kinds of data. And they're creating a lot of value by um, basically picking data and labels and tasks in clever, clever ways uh, to um, eventually uh, build a more accurate system or something, and then um, that, that's going to actually generate some real world value. And lastly, there's like the engineers, <laughs> like myself, who are basically plumbing the whole system to scale it better, to make it much faster. Um, these are the GPU experts. These are the distributed experts. Like this, this is like the Robert Nishiharas of the world, um, who are doing a lot of work to make sure systems can be more efficient, faster, and probably going to scale uh, that we have never seen before. Um, so let's just put them all like, you know, in a, uh, what do you call this? Pie chart? Not pie chart. Venn diagram. So let's put this all in a Venn diagram, right? So you have your algorithm experts, engineering experts, data experts, and they're all driving different kinds of value. So for example, the algorithmic experts, like in the last few years, have driven innovations like transformers, ResNets, diffusion models, GANs, and the data experts, like, have, you know, it's, I'm only trying to cover my world, which is deep learning, um, and they've built out amazing new data sets that have, in turn, driven a lot of uh, value and innovation, uh, and they've also, like, built out tasks, like, for example, language modeling as a task. Uh, is like a task innovation, right? It's not what model gets used under, it's, oh, you can actually try to create um, uh, a, a system where all you're doing is like predicting the next word or something like that. And, and then lastly, like engineers have been some of the biggest drivers for like the deep learning uh, and like the more recent machine learning revolution by, by driving accelerators and uh, making uh, the, these models scale to a large, large, large number of accelerators uh, together all at once. And I, I want to call out like, you know, Ray 2.0, because I'm at the Ray conference, like Ray 2.0 pretty much is like trying to make the whole engineering piece lift it up and making it much easier to use for the other two kinds of experts. Um, and, and so does PyTorch. Uh, so one of the things I want to point out is if you are at the intersection of this Venn diagram, if you're an like if you basically are good at all these three things, you are very rare, and you are probably very very valuable, and like a lot of people are like knocking on your door. Um, and if you're a, if you're a person who's running a company, and you can 
hire a bunch of people within this intersection, you are also very, very lucky. But we cannot assume that we're gonna find like a bunch of people, um, you know, especially in a larger team, to all be having intersectional skills like this. So when, like one thing I wanna um, uh, talk about is when people don't have the full context of the system and have full intersectional skills, they basically care about the knobs they have to drive value and innovation, and they do not wanna deal with the knobs that they, they don't really drive uh, innovation out of. So they want exposition of things that they would care about, and they want well-abstracted, well-hidden um, um, technology that they don't need to day-to-day -day deal with. So coming back uh, to, the, to, to this slide, for example, so we took this, this uh, market analysis uh, for PyTorch, and at some point, we made a call in 2016 saying, um, a lot of innovation in the next few years would be driven by algorithmic experts. They are going to build models that are more complex, that are more innovative, that are more, um, um, you know, that are just like clever, and that building clever models is going to drive a lot of innovation in the next few years. So we made that bet. So we basically put like a hat on them, and then we said, we want to serve these people really well, and if you're going to make technology decisions that have to trade off who's going to be comfortable among these three sets of people, we want to make sure the technology decisions get prioritized to make the experience of algorithmic experts well. So what actually, as a consequence of that, PyTorch was uh, one of the few frameworks back in 2016 that basically prioritized this concept of model being code. That is, model is not a config file, model is not a symbolic metaprogramming system, model is just code, model is just Python code. Um, and then the other thing we prioritized was we, we built a very large API surface. So PyTorch has like 1,200 operators. And like a lot of the algorithmic innovations are like taking these 1,200 operators and cleverly like combinatorially composing them to build novel value. Um, if you have a mathematical idea as an algorithmic expert, you would basically try to map that idea to like using these operators to like build out that idea. And you need this kind of diversity in operators and this, this, these many number of operators to be able to like make sure the algorithmic innovators are not bottlenecked by what idea can be expressed. So these two things we, we made sure. And by model uh, as code, I basically mean standard PyTorch code where like this Python code here is, um, is, is basically what defines your neural network. Like there is no separation, like there is no disconnect between, oh, I wrote this code and eventually I'll have to think about what this code will do within a larger system. And this comes with the, uh, why did like, you know, like I, I think I covered like why we entered it, but also like what that means is we enabled various innovations, like a bunch of models that need a dynamic control flow and dynamic shapes, like recursive networks, a bunch of NLP models needed some of these things. And also like when you write model as code, it's way easier to change like how you're training your model, like how you're um, iterating on it. And so we did this stuff and this came at a cost. Like the, the people who are like on the engineering side kind of like actually don't like PyTorch as much because we're making them do a lot of extra work because we're not giving them um, the models in like a uniform way that they can uh, transform uh, in, uh, in code easily and stuff. So this, this came at a cost. This was not, this was like, we actively traded off engineers' convenience here to like prioritize algorithmic experts. Um, and again, as I said, we have a large API surface. Uh, and again, this also came at a cost. Like engineers are annoyed uh, that PyTorch has 1,200 operators and if they're gonna have to do any kinds of global um, support for a new, a new feature, they'll have to like do a large plumbing of um, uh, supporting all these operators. Um, and so what do we actually hide? So what we hide um, are like distributed 
um, like various engineering optimizations, like all, all kinds of acceleration, and also like data loading complexities. Like these are things we thought algorithmic experts don't want to deal with. Like that's just not where they feel like they would drive the value from. Now, obviously the world has moved on from 2016, right? So one of the things uh, I want to say is like we, we have this mental framework and we constantly think about adjusting the hotspot. Um, we want to stay relevant and we want to stay dynamic as a product. So what we do uh, uh, quite often, especially it's my job as like you know, one of the main strategists for the project, is to think of various uh, future events. So if you think of future, you, you can't think of a single direction. You think of like a distribution of events, each of them having a certain probability. And we think of a bunch of events and then we think about um, what we're going to do if that those events are going to come true. So for example, we constantly ask ourselves within like the, the framework that we have of our audience, okay, who are we prioritizing and how much weight we're giving to the priority? And then what, like because we're prioritizing certain audiences over the other audiences, what knobs are we exposing and what knobs are we hiding? The more knobs we expose, um, universally, the more complex the system gets. So you need to find a sweet spot where you expose the knobs that you think have a high probability of driving future value, and you want to like abstract away the knobs that uh, you think are lower priority in terms of actually driving future value. So let's, you know, for fun, <laughs> see a few uh, possible events that might happen in the future, and then how we would think about changing our product, for example. So event one, um, let's just say the world basically says, oh, modeling innovation has gotten overrated. Uh, everyone will just use one kind of transformer and one kind of con net. And like usually a lot of innovation will just be driven by putting more data through it or put, like making them uh, larger. And like we're, we're not gonna do that much of model exploration anymore, right? If that's the case, we'll have to pivot PyTorch to make the job of the engineers uh, and, and the data uh, and task innovators a lot better. So we, we work on a lot of projects like building various kinds of compilers and program transformers that will make these people's life easier. And we're seeing this trend. And so we're actually building uh, a lot of this infrastructure over the last like year or so. Um, and we'll, re we'll, we'll release it at some point. So that's just like one thing that we, for example, we think as a trend is happening, we're not entirely sure if it will hold out to be true, but if it's true, then we, we wanna be prepped. Um, and then secondly, another event, just for fun, um, a lot of the last three years or so has been a lot about scaling models, right? Same model, but you scale it to like 100x its size, is having outsized um, accuracy increases or like it ha it's having phase changes and things like that. And one of the really cool things about the Python ecosystem is PyTorch is coexisting with Ray and you know, various other technologies, which are actually helping out in the scaling uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, learning ML models. So um, PyTorch and Ray, for example, are like very complementary. Like the whole Ray AI runtime like uses, you can, you can write PyTorch code and then like, you know, distribute it with Ray and stuff. And we're also like, uh, we're, are developing first party solutions uh, in, in, in this case. And uh, another, another example is like, if, if you can see a world where all people do is they are pulling some base model and then they're fine tuning it or they're prompting it or something like that. Then regardless and completely independent of PyTorch, there's gonna be like a lot of like model hubs and marketplaces and you know, the hugging face of the world will be more relevant and popular than ever. And in that case, like PyTorch really doesn't have much of a change in itself, but like we think about what peripheral integrations and stuff that we need to build ahead of time. Uh, so that's all I had, and I just wanted to leave with one small message. It's really important to think about progress of a field as a function of the, the cool ideas you have, 
and then whether there are tools that are there to implement your cool ideas. I, as like a very simple um, like toy event, like what if someone in the 16th century like wanted to do machine learning or something, right? Like, so like, I, I think it's really important to be very open to tools and constantly trying uh, new tools and changing tools and the tools themselves willing to be innovative or probably dying. And if either one of, if you are stopped gen not generating the right ideas or if the tools are not available uh, to generate the ideas, you're, we're probably going to be stuck at some kind of local, local minima uh, as like humanity. So let's continue to make progress and be open to new ideas and tools. Thank you. Thank you.